uh, Mazda's extensive motorsport programs here in North America. Quite a few young racers, we've been talking about two of them a lot uh, over the course of the last three years, Kenton Cook and a, uh, a wounded uh, warrior, Liam Dwyer, uh, fascinating story, and both of those gentlemen would not be where they are today without the help of Mazda Motorsports. And John is the decision maker behind <laughs> helping convince the, the powers day. that be uh, that they need to support these grassroots road racing programs and the road to Indy. Our next guest is one of my net gen drivers who I'm very proud of, Julia Landauer. She is a professional race car driver. Just 23 years old, Julia's had an incredible lifetime of accomplishments. How about being a competitor on the Survivor TV show? A science degree from Stanford, a very inspirational TEDx talk that I enjoyed as a science geek, um, and now the first woman to win a track championship at the Motor Mile, and that is a tough track to get around. Look out, NASCAR, Julia's on the way. She has the talent to chase her highest racing dreams. And finally, Mike Lewis, the senior VP over at uh, Don Schumacher Racing. There's an old saying around racing, if you're turning your race car, you're not going fast enough. That's what drag racers love to tell you. And Mike is the right-hand man for one of the legends of our sport, uh, the great Don Schumacher. Um, they're the, you guys are the New York Yankees of the NHRA. Uh, that's the only way to put it. And you're only, you're probably the only person up on the stage here who understands what it feels like to go about 270 miles an hour. I think that's the top speed you, yeah. you reach. So quite an accomplishment there. So I'm going to throw this question out and um, this is going to be my game show, uh, you know, $50 toss up question for whoever wants to, to buzz in. Talent or money, which matters more in today's racing world? Go ahead, John. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll take a stab. First of all, thank you very much for having us. Um, it's terrific to be here at PRI and have this opportunity to share. I'm going to twist it a little bit, and I'm going to say neither one. Um, we, have, we have a challenge in this industry, and it's called value. And I think it's all of our responsibilities, no matter what role we play, whether it's a track operator or a race team owner or a driver or a series uh, owner or organizer, that we need to create a value equation uh, for young talent, whether it's drivers behind the wheel or race teams themselves or engineers that are trying to grow their career in this business. Uh, and we need to create uh, more value. We need to look outside of our paddock, outside of our series, outside of our fan base to try to grow uh, this business and grow the value equation. So clearly, uh, not to derail the question, certainly talented drivers make it to the top. Certainly, it's um, an expensive sport. We all know that. but. I think we need to look at it very differently, and my entire staff and our, our team challenges ourselves every single uh, decision to build a value equation that makes sense for our investment as well as those who are investing, in our case, racing a Mazda. Julia, you have hands-on experience of how tough it is for a young racer to sell yourself. Yeah, and to piggyback on that, you can't make it to the top with either just talent or just money. You need, it's an ecosystem, you need both and a bunch of other things. Um, but I do think that there is room to really incorporate driver development and the star power that goes along with that into making the series overall more valuable, more fruitful. Um, and it, but it is unfortunate you see plenty of talented racers who won't ever make it. And then you see some people with maybe a little less talent who can make it to a certain point. But at the end of the day, winning races is what catches attention. And I think uh, we're in a really creative time right now where a driver has a lot of freedom to figure out how to go about getting funding and how to make it work, how to present themselves as valuable in non-traditional ways. And so I think that freedom is making it really exciting. Dan, you've seen a lot of young racers come up through the ranks and helped quite a few of them. 
What is it about a young racer, other than just their talent, that jumps out at you and says, man, that is someone we need in our program? Well, thank you for having me on the panel. I appreciate the time. And uh, just to follow up a little bit on uh, John and Julia's comments and to try to answer your question, the talent versus money, uh, I've been doing this a while, and, and uh, not only on the promotion side, but also on the team owner side. And uh, both are important, and if I had to choose between the two, I've seen a lot of drivers with money uh, get further than drivers with talent, but then stall, because ultimately, this is still a sport that requires talent. Um, and to me, the talent side of the equation nowadays needs to mean more than driving talent. The drivers need to understand the financial component of it, and, and they do. Um, I'm sure Julia can respond to this as well, but um, part of being a race car driver today is representing the sponsor partners that you need to move up the ladder uh, to get to your career aspiration, which is to finally <coughs> be a fully paid professional race car driver. But to get there, the, the, the development levels, which is what we promote, do require drivers to, to uh, assist in the funding to the teams. And um, having the talent to raise money as well as the talent to drive is the combination that's needed. If you can't make it purely on money, you have to have talent, you'll, you'll just never win enough races or championships to move up. Um, and you can make it on talent with no money. I've seen a number of drivers who have risen all the way to the top of our open wheel ladder and, and drive an Indy car and, and not had family money or any other money, but they've learned the business of racing, which is something that Mazda actually teaches to our drivers in our program. Uh, so that's a long-winded answer, but uh, I think the talent uh, is supreme ultimately, uh, but nowadays the talent to help yourself financially is also important. Mike, as a drag racer, you're, you're looking at a whole different set of, of talent in the sport, but we had a great discussion when we ran into you uh, down before the SEMA show down in Vegas when you guys were finishing up. And you talked to us about the concept of drivers as entrepreneurs. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit for our folks? A driver has to be marketable, which includes the talent component, which includes the personality component. And forgive my voice. Uh, hopefully, we could wash this before somebody uses it again. <laughs> but it takes it takes marketability. Um, we have seven drivers. Tony Schumacher obviously is Don's son, so the other six have all come to DSR on the basis of talent and marketability. Um, Ron Caps is a perfect spokesman for Napa. Not only does he do a great job driving the car, but he's outgoing, great with fans, and he's willing to do things that nobody sees. And between Brainerd and, I actually it was between Seattle and Brainerd, he spent a week in Alaska with Napa. He'll go to Hawaii, and nobody knows that, unless you follow him on social media. Antron Brown does an incredible amount of things here in this community, but things for both Toyota, Matco, that nobody hears about, but that, that make him marketable and valuable to his sponsors. Uh, so every one of our drivers is at DSR on the basis of talent and marketability. Right now, none of them have come on the basis of bringing money to DSR. Uh, we just filled our seventh team. Uh, Sean Langdon will drive our third top fuel car. And that's because Sean, A, is a terrific driver, a terrific human being. He'll also fit the key ingredient called chemistry, where his team, his backers, which include fans and family and everybody else, but mostly his sponsors, believe in him that he can get the job done. That drives the passion that we all have to go out there and be successful. So, you know, sh I don't know how short that was, but it's a difficult question to answer. Every driver has a unique set of circumstances. There are some really good drivers in our sport, too, that just aren't going to make it because they don't get it. And there's some drivers that bring money, and they can go out there and race, but they can't win because they don't have the talent. Or they don't have the time to develop their talent. So it's a difficult thing. We have a lot of people. Sean is one of them. Leah Pritchett is a great young talent. 
been a few minutes through our junior dragster program and in their 20s, Sean's now 30, they've raced since they've been eight years old. Drag racing, that's still fairly new to say that. A lot of you could say that, you know, with quarter midgets and things of that nature, but they know how to race and they've had to learn how to become marketable. So that's my two cents. And we've, we're talking about this concept of drivers as commodities, as brands. And Julia, you really understand that because you have a whole talk that you do talking about the brand of you. Can you kind of share that with us? Yeah, well, I also think that the branding goes beyond just the driver, right? I need to make myself stick out in a crowd. I need to be valuable to companies. But especially in the context of NASCAR, because it's such a long series, and if you're thinking for, you know, what the trucks Xfinity or cup level, you know, it's a saga that goes on for the majority of the year. And so having a personality and a story that you're telling along the way is going to get the fans more engaged, which helps the series and helps your sponsors and everyone. So that's really important. And the biggest thing that I've learned, and it's taken a little while to be comfortable with, and it stemmed from being on Survivor and getting that harsh, harsh <laughs> feedback from fans on social media or non-fans, is really just being authentic and showing the behind the scenes and showing the work that goes into racing. I think everyone, many people assume, oh, just go out and drive the car, go practice, get on the track, and it's like, well, easier said than done. It's, it's pretty expensive, and so showing everything that goes into it, I think, allows more people to have a greater appreciation for it, and then you're able to really get a strong support system that understands why you're doing this seemingly foreign sport to so many people. One skill that you don't lack is the ability to uh, sell yourself. Um, that's very obvious. And there are so many good programs out there now that are, are working with young racers. And I noticed one of uh, the young racers that I've worked with through the Team USA scholarship program that Jeremy Shaw does. Mackay Stevens is down in the front row here. He waved to everybody. And one of the things that we worked on with Mackay was the ability to promote and sell himself as a commodity. Dan, the question for you, what skills are lacking the most in today's young up and coming drivers that you would like to see them develop themselves more at? They're great on the track, but what other skills do they need that they're lacking right now? Um, in the Mazda Road to Indy, we have a uh, a program called the Mazda Road to Indy Summit Program, and we work on developing the driver's skills outside of the cockpit. Um, and the kids that come through our series, they enter our, our first step in the development ladder at 14 years old. Um, so maturity is the thing they need to develop the most, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, uh, we work on their, their ability to represent companies, uh, their ability to deal with the media, physical fitness uh, training. Um, there's a lot of different aspects, uh, engineering, data acquisition. Just driving the race car uh, as a pure, um, fearless type of driver that the, f the average fan thinks is all it takes. Step on the gas and, and, and be fearless. It's way beyond that. Uh, the physical fitness aspects of open wheel racing are extreme. Um, and then the business side of it re just requires all of that training. So what a lot of the young drivers lack um, is the public speaking ability, the, the ability to to uh, to sell themselves as as Julia has has done, and, and many drivers have to learn how to do to to advance. And uh, with Mazda support um, and in the program that we developed and and uh, and IndyCar has assisted in, does a lot to train the drivers, train these kids as they move up the ladder, so that when they finally do get to Indy Lights and then IndyCar there are more fully rounded uh, personalities. There are some that come natural at that, but most of them need some work. John, uh, from the manufacturer standpoint, I'm gonna ask the same question in a slightly different way. What is it that you see in some of the young drivers that would chase you away? <laughs> well, social media has become a, an interesting tool <laughs> in that respect. Uh, certainly that becomes a challenge because their voice and their face put uh, together on social media can certainly create uh, some challenging situations with our executive team, with our Mazda dealers, with general fans and consumers and followers of the brand. So that, that's a big one. Uh, just uh, last month we had our national 
Mazda dealer meeting in, in Las Vegas. Um, so behaviors uh, in Las Vegas stay in Las Vegas, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, between our team, looked at our lineup of drivers and kind of used a benchmark of who, who are you willing to put in front of a group of Mazda dealers or in front of a television camera or who would you allow to sit down with a group of dealers at a dinner uh, who you know is going to... Uh, act appropriately, act professionally, uh, speak highly of their experience uh, in motorsport because of the brand, and, uh, and it worked out terrific. And, and you, know, you set guidelines and, and those types of things. But for, from my standpoint, I think the, the biggest one is, is social media. And then also, to Dan's point, not understanding the business acumen. Uh, when we bring partners in, not just Mazda, but other partners, Cooper Tire, uh, and some of the other key partners that we have in our series, like Battery Tender and, and BF Goodrich, you you want to bring executives from those companies uh, to your point with with Ron going with Napa, um, and and know that when they speak to those folks, um, they're educated enough and understand the business that that partner has, unrelated to racing, and be able to uh, engage in a conversation that's meaningful to that partner. Can I just add something on the social media thing, just to what I thought was a humorous little story. Uh, a number of years ago, I owned the uh, Indy Lights race team, and Bobby Rahal was partners with me in that team. And uh, g dealing with Bobby, we were talking one day, and he said, you know, I've got this particular driver that wants to, uh, he's won some races, he wants to get a try in my Indy car seat. And uh, I said, so what are you going to do? I knew the driver, and he had won some races. And he said, well, I went to his Facebook page, and there was a picture of him flipping the bird to the camera, and I decided he wasn't appropriate for our partner brand. So <laughs> the social media nowadays, the kids need to learn to be very careful what they're putting out there because anybody, any business person running a team who wants to select a driver to be on their team is going to look at that. They're going to check them out and see what they're all about in their personal life. So uh, we need to train them that. Antron Brown won the Top Fuel Championship in 2012. Great guy. If you've ever met him, he is the most upbeat person you'll ever meet. Never had a bad minute. Worked for DSR since the end of 03. Um, so we're really proud of him. He doesn't play. He's won some races. He wants to get a try in my IndyCar seat. And I said, so what are you going to do? I knew the driver, and he had won some races. And he said, well, I went to his Facebook page, and there was a picture of him flipping the bird to the camera. And I decided he wasn't appropriate for our partner brand. <laughs> So <laughs> the social media nowadays, the kids need to learn to be very careful what they're putting out there because anybody, any business person running a team who wants to select a driver to be on their team is going to look at that, going to check them out and see what they're all about in their personal life. So uh, we need to train them that. Antron Brown won the Top Fuel Championship in 2012. Great guy. If you've ever met him, he is the most upbeat person you'll ever meet. Never had a bad minute. Worked for DSR since the end of 03. Um, so we're really proud of him. He doesn't play up the fact that he's African American, but yet, in fact, he was the first African American to win a major motorsports championship. And we thought that maybe would help get him on Jay Leno's show. We spent a day with Jay, but we didn't get on the show. Um, he won his second championship a month ago. We didn't try again, but what the Toyota people decided to do was to take Antron on kind of a, a tour of key locations, one of which was a Knicks game. And if you sit courtside at a Knicks game, you're going to be close to Spike Lee. Perfect opportunity for a selfie. You're going to be close to Jimmy Fallon. Great selfie that went viral. So Antron accomplished more, I won't say more, but accomplished a great deal by being in the right place at the right time, by being personable. Um, with help from our sponsors, and that's how social media can work to build the brand named Antron Brown. And Antron Brown is just a special guy. Um, I had watched him on TV, and I had the opportunity to uh, do some drag racing coverage, and I thought there is no way this guy is as nice as he is, and he is as nice to anybody. He's just, you're right, he's never had a bad minute. I, I'd love to have his positive mental attitude. Well, we all. He's just, he's an amazing man. Um, 
And I'm going to fire this question right back at you, though, since we're talking about Antron. And we have Julia on the stage, and we were hearing from Lynn earlier in, in the day. Diversity in motorsports, and especially in the driver's seat, is it just talk? Is it just to look good? Or is there a benefit to this? And while I'm at it, why did drag racing get it right so many years before everybody else? Probably because it was easier to go drag racing. Um, anybody sitting at a stoplight looking over at another car can imagine drag racing. I don't know why Malcolm Durham was successful as an African-American match racer back east. Um, I've got a great friend named Rodney Flournoy who raced funny cars with his father. He and his wife and their two children now race a fuel altered. It's not about money, it's about their passion for our sport. Um, and everybody mixes on the basis of a common interest, a common uh, a degree of talent. Um, we had Khaled Al Belushi drive for us at the U.S. Nationals, and he fit in perfectly. I think we're uh, probably an organization. We've raced in Abu Dhabi. We've raced. Um, Don's raced in Europe a number of times. We look at people on the basis of talent and marketability. If there are two drivers and one is male and one is female, and we have an opportunity to reach a female demographic, okay, obviously we're gonna lean in that direction, all other things being equal. Um, we have girls that work on our cars. Um, Marlo Quinn did the clutch on uh, Sean Langdon's car and raced against her husband who works on Antron's car. They both do the clutch. <laughs> um, and they had told us that they were gonna leave after the Pomona race and go to Tennessee, where he's from, and start a family. So the fact that their two cars made the last run of the season was really a special moment. They stood holding hands, and it was really cool until her team won, and she ran away from her husband and joined the party on, on, uh, with the rest of her team, and Mike stood there just thinking, what have I chopped liver? I mean, but it was just a special moment where it doesn't matter. I mean. There are gender issues because of rooming, because of other considerations, but when it comes to talent, we just look for talent. Okay, Julia, I'm gonna put you on the spot here because I said, when I introduced you, you're the first woman to win a track championship at the Motor Mile. I could have also spun that news in a different way because that was your first full year at the Motor Mile, and rookies don't win track championships at the Motor Mile. Is it a good thing or a bad thing that I'm pointing out that you were the first woman? That's an interesting question, because I think on the one hand, it's really cool to show that women can do it too. There were so many little girls that came up um, during the autograph sessions and said, I didn't know that girls could race. And you just realize that and it's like, wow, it's not even an option for so many people. On the flip side, I wonder, just as with other you know, fields where it's male dominated does constantly bringing it up that, oh, women aren't in the sport, they, they're they still minority. Does that just kind of perpetuate the issue? Um, and I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. I think that one of the keys to my success this year was that my team didn't treat me like I was diverse. I mean, my team owner yelled at me when I needed to be yelled at and they praised me when I needed to be praised and, you know, weren't afraid of hurting my feelings and they didn't tiptoe around me. And I think that was really the key thing that we were able to get quick very efficiently. And so I think part of it is just gonna be changing that culture and show that you can be your normal dude self around a female racer, you're more, more or less not gonna offend her most likely. So I think changing the culture a little bit, but it's just, it's a slow process. And I think, you know, Lynn's been a mentor of mine forever and, you know, she's made great strides and it's just a constant, constant work in progress. Changing the subject a little bit, and John, I mentioned when I introduced you about the great support for what I call the lower levels, the grassroots levels. And I mentioned Kenton and Liam, who are two young men that I just admire so much. Um, what is it about these lower grassroots series that you guys see as a manufacturer? What convinces you that you need to look at driver development with a different return on investment way of looking at it than you do for any other motorsport program you would support? So uh, the primary base of our strategy is grassroots, and it's in 
each year when we go into the executive boardroom to explain the value of our programs, it's got sustainability because it's got a parts program that generates millions of dollars in revenue for the company. So that's, that's the foundation. And many of the executives uh, and many members of, of my, mo my motorsports team are racers themselves on the weekends. So they understand talent, they understand money, they understand marketability. And we sat back and looked at the fact that there wasn't anything like it in the industry. Uh, a true driver development program that had scholarship money attached to it from go-karting to the Verizon IndyCar Series, or in our case, from grassroots racing to uh, the upper levels of sports car racing. So uh, that was really the, the, uh, the candle that, that lit the whole thing. And, um, and frankly, you look at uh, the opportunities that are available through the Mazda Road to Indy, or what we now call the Mazda Road to 24, uh, each year we provide millions of dollars in scholarship to young, young drivers that have the talent, may not have the money, have the marketability outside the car that we believe can uh, help promote our brand and the brands that are associated with our programs. Um, Liam's story, uh, it's unbelievable. Um, I get chills every time I say his name. Uh, he was at the dealer meeting, but uh, you look back at what he's been through uh, is serving our country in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, twice being, being severely injured by IEDs and never once given up. Uh, that's a big part of what our brand stands for, following his passion. And he shared a dream with us, and we said we'd like to help make it come true. And I think that's been the philosophy of both the Mazda Road to Indy and the Mazda Road to 24 is now expanding to global series that come here to the United States provide a very clear path for success with funding, and along the way, educate them at every step about uh, marketing, about the business acumen that it takes uh, to be successful. So um, we, we've had a terrific run. Uh, we're just getting started uh, because I f we still believe there's nothing like either of those things in the world with true scholarships for drivers to go to the next level. And since I'm bragging about those that are supporting great scholarship programs, I'm going to brag about Skip Barber, because Kenton Cook wouldn't be where he is today without, I think it's like five years in a row he's won scholarship money through that program. And that's the only reason that my personal friend, the Gumby, uh, gets a chance to race. And if you don't know the story about Kenton, one of the ways that he helped sell himself is his hometown there in California is the home of Gumby. So they have a Gumby festival. So he was a personal friend of Gumby and that's been a big way of him promoting himself as he's worked his way up through the grassroots level. We're gonna wrap things up, but I wanna give everyone one last chance to uh, kind of share some thoughts with us. So Dan, we're gonna start at the end, final thoughts that we need to bring away from our uh, driver development panel here. Well, thank you very much. Um, and uh, I, I need to publicly thank Mazda for what they do. The scholarship program that John alluded to is millions of dollars that they have given. In our program, a driver wins on the first level and gets a scholarship that funds his next level. He wins on the next level, he gets a bigger scholarship because it, the costs escalate. And uh, Mazda has backed this program for years. And we have drivers like Spencer Piggott who will be at the Indy 500, the 100th running next year having won scholarships from Skip Barber all the way up the ladder uh, with Mazda support, and, uh, and we will be cheering him on. We've got uh, more than 20 drivers that are in IndyCar that have come through the ladder, and uh, we appreciate what Mazda's done. Um, driver development's an interesting topic. It's, it's something that's very near and dear to my heart, and I appreciate being part of the panel. Thank you. John, your thoughts? I think it's just important that we remember that we are generating the next generation of racing hero or uh, successful business uh, uh, member of this sport, uh, whether it's a technician or an engineer or drivers. Uh, we're providing a platform, all of us are, for them to grow in this business. And you know, as a young boy, I had you know my racing heroes up in my bedroom. Uh, I'm a fan of the entire sport, whether it's drag racing, stock cars, sports cars, and I remember those names and the names that are, that are developing themselves now at whatever level, Julia, Spencer, you mentioned, Kenton, uh, they are the heroes of the future. 
and the junior dragsters and, and all those things. And I think we cannot lose sight of that. And, and we all are in a, in a rush and as Joey said, speed business. And we're all trying to get to that next event or get to that next deal. And we, got, we can't forget about what's coming in the next 10, 20, 30 years uh, in our sport. And we're having an impact on that now. And I think uh, it's a long process. But if we lose sight of the feeder right now, uh, we're going to be in big trouble down the road. Julia. Well, thank you for having me as well. And to kind of add on to all of that, I think that there are so many resources that drivers have and teams have and sanctioning bodies have that if we could collaborate more and more, that will just be so much more fruitful for everyone. I think that there's things that we don't think about, um, that teams don't think about, that sanctioning bodies might not think that we could benefit from. And so having more open dialogue about that, what a driver needs to do, I think you guys are doing a great job. Um, I think it's really exciting. As I said, it's a creative time for a driver and for a series, and we do need to cultivate that younger generation of racers. And I know in NASCAR, you know, Jeff Gordon just retired, Tony Stewart's about to retire, who knows when Dale Jr. and Jimmy Johnson are coming next. So having that star power in the younger generation is going to be really crucial. Mike. <coughs> Tony Schumacher talks to more students than any of our drivers. And one of the things he'll talk about frequently is how, ca how he came to represent the U.S. Army. It was in Seattle in 2000 when he and his dad heard that the Army was coming to Sonoma the following weekend to interview a certain team, not ours, to represent the Army. Um, so Tony and Don somehow pulled strings so that at least they would have a short meeting. Tony, in the meantime, cut his hair off. That flat top that you see today started in Seattle in 2000. He did all the homework that he could so when he went into that meeting, he could talk the talk, and he's not uh, a veteran, but that he convinced the Army on that day that he would be their best brand spokesman. And that was 16 years ago. And the message to young drivers today is when you have an opportunity to talk to a prospect, whether it's an employer as an individual or whether it's a potential sponsor, do your homework. Find out what it takes to create the value that you discussed, John. As a driver, you've got to bring skills. You've got to bring value. Uh, Antron's got a practice car at home, a full cockpit with a Christmas tree. And he doesn't do eight or ten reps a day. He'll do 15 minutes of reps, and he may change the configuration of the throttle pedal, the brake handle, and do 15 more minutes and he'll find out where he's got his best reaction time so that when it's time to go to the starting line, if he can pick up a hundredth of a second in a sport where you win or lose by a thousandth, that's how you win championships. Thank you, by the way. I appreciate the opportunity. And sorry for the – I'm going to take my very white voice home and see where it gets me. <laughs> yeah, that's I, – I feel your pain, I, if anyone who heard me at lunchtime. Um, what did we learn from this group uh, – I learned three specific things. Learn how to sell yourself. Nobody else is gonna do it better than you. You are your own brand. And watch how you sell yourself. Um, you don't wanna put yourself out there in a way that turns the manufacturers off. And what else we need? We need more scholarship money in this sport. Um, the series aren't going to do it. The teams can't afford to do it in many cases, and so it's going to be up to some unique ways, maybe the manufacturers, maybe some other marketing partners, to come up with some sponsorship ideas. So please give a round of applause to our driver development panel.